Welcome to Fossil Creek Nursery and Tree Farm. Uh, today we're going to be talking about butterflies and hummingbirds and getting them to show up. And we've got a bunch of stuff to make it happen. And let's see. Here we are. And first of all, uh, typically the things that attract butterflies are full sun to part sun. And here in North Texas, that means if you get five or six hours of sun, that's full sun. So uh, don't get the feeling that if I don't have it all day, I'm not in business. And of course, some of the other things that uh, they would prefer uh, in the area that you want to do butterflies is uh, cover, having some shrubs around, uh, some water. In fact, uh, you might want to add to the water uh, some dirt so you have mud because uh, they can get minerals and salts from a little muddy spot. Uh, if you haven't ever seen that, you put out some mud, I think you will. Um, and uh, of course they get most of their water from the, the nectar, but it, it doesn't hurt occasionally to sprinkle a little bit on the foliage to where it's easy for them to get a drink. But uh, the um, butterfly plants, since we're talking, this is a store butterfly here. Yeah, <laughs> that was his cue. Um, they're, uh, they're attracted to flowers, of course, uh, for the nectar. Watering uh, for the plants is best if you're doing that to their roots. You know, overhead sprinkling would be the last thing uh, because uh, you're going to be watering the flowers, which, you know, could dilute some of the nectar or... Uh, uh, wash it away, which is not a big deal, but the other thing is the uh, foliage is not going to appreciate it. Uh, although, with the weather we've had so far this year, the humidity is so low, I don't guess we have to worry a whole lot about the fungus problems because uh, I think the fungus uh, on foliage this year may be an endangered species because it's uh, so dry. Uh, weepy moment. Okay, we're good. Uh, but uh, of course, the other thing is uh, the uh, using a drip irrigation or watering the soil will conserve moisture. Good idea to have mulch there since that will uh, conserve moisture and insulate the roots from heat. A lot of the plants are uh, heat tolerant, but that's kind of the foliage. You know, the roots never object to being cool relative to if it's 105, the roots don't want to be 105. If you have exposed soil, the soil temperature can go through the roof, but you have a little mulch on there, soil temperature is going to stay low. In fact, if you haven't ever done it, if you, you know, have the odd weed that comes up through mulch and you go to pull it out, when you pull that mulch away and you get down there and a little bit of dirt to pull that weed, do you always notice that, wow, that's, that soil's kind of cool. You get below that mulch and that's not bad. So that helps out the plants and uh, conserves moisture, deters weeds, and over time, uh, the mulch, I like to use hardwood mulch because over time it breaks down and adds to the soil. Uh, the other thing that's important here is since we have uh, typically clay soil, uh, everybody knows what clay soil can do. It can be a good glue or it can be a, a good... Uh, substitute for concrete, whichever you'd like. If it's dry, it's like concrete. If it's wet, it's sticky. But the thing that happens is when it dries out, uh, it's uh, kind of impermeable to water. And that's bad because if you go to water a plant, you want the water to go down in there. If you go to fertilize a plant, you want the fertilizer to percolate down to the roots. Uh, that's hard to do with the soil surface is compacted and uh, dry from being exposed. So the mulch on there 
keeps the soil so surface uh, moist and permeable. A lot of the uh, perennials are adapted to harsh conditions, but if you give them a little help, they're not insulted. Uh, you know, if you improve the soil, and of course the other thing that goes along with that, they regard that as, most of them as, as help. Uh, but if you uh, start killing them with kindness in the way of water, they don't necessarily appreciate that. You know, they're, they're adapted to harsh, so if you want to uh, water them too frequently, a lot of them will deteriorate because they're, they're not up to that. But um, adding amendments to the soil to make it more permeable and then having a mulch on top, that uh, increases your uh, margin of error. That lets excess water percolate away. Uh, a raised bed, uh, that's kind of the magic words or a big pot, uh, that makes it easier because you're controlling the soil and the excess you know, always percolates away when you're using a good potting soil or a, a raised bed type of thing. Uh, let's see. And, uh, let me see. I brought my notes so I don't get far afield. That's a $64,000 question. And the key to that is, as often as they need it. An answer which sounds like a non-answer, but, you know, it's kind of like, a, you know, what the lead-in was. If they don't need it and you're feeling, you know, giving uh, and supporting, uh, if you give them water when they don't need it, you know, it's not a plus, and you can't, uh, you can't actually, you know, give them water and say, well, you don't need it now, but I'm gonna, you're gonna store it for when you need it later. Um, in, in a way, that can happen. If you're doing a raised bed, when you do water, uh, you're gonna do an adequate amount to soak that soil. Or if you're in a big pot, you want to water enough that you're gonna soak that uh, root ball so that. They will hold on to some water for later, but because you've got an improved soil, the excess drains away. The better your soil, the greater your margin for error, and also the more vigor the plant's going to have. So the more established you know, the plant is, the more vigorous it is, and the more able it's able to stand up to stress. So that's kind of what you're shooting for. And, of course, uh, if you're doing some of them in containers uh, in July, that may be every day. But you always, you get a drainage hole in the bottom, always in a pot. Excess water always drains away. But what I started to say is that the way you determine that is you learn to read plants. And if you were to, if you were to really be an attentive student, you could actually go crazy and have a little journal nothing fancy cheap spiral ring you know if you're trying to get a handle on it you know you could note when you water and then when it wilts that's what you're reading on the plants is when do they wilt if you look at them in the morning and the evening they can, if, if they're okay in the morning but then in the evening they've wilted they can't have wilted for very long and then when they do that, you water them in probably 30 minutes, they're back up. Well, then you think, when was the last time I watered that pot? What was the weather? And how long did it go between waterings? You know, and that you start to get a heads up about what they require. And of course, uh, the weather's going to affect it. Did we get an inch of rain in one of those days? Or did we have some days like we had just a while back? work blew 30 miles an hour all day and maybe even all night so those are what i call hair dryer days especially even if it's from the north if the humidity is 18 degrees it may not be hot but it's exceedingly dry and if it blows all day that plant is going to use up a lot of water uh, 
that, should you go on ahead and water them towards the evening whenever it's kind of cooler? Well, the, the, uh, I mean, we have some pretty hot days down oh. here, and I mean, the watering cycles here in Texas, you only can water twice a week because they have you on a watering restriction. Well, I think most places, if you're watering by hand, you can, water you can do whatever you want. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, typically, uh, I like to water in the morning because uh, that's the closest time to when the heat of the afternoon is going to show up. So they're going to get a big drink, and a few hours later, the heat shows up, and they've just, you know, had their drink. So they're able to stand up to it. Um, but that brings up a point that uh, heat and low humidity, things like that, can contribute to a plant using up water, but they're not people. When we get hot, we say, I want some iced tea, and I don't even want it as much for the liquid as I'm gonna drink something cold, and it's gonna help to cool me off. Plants, you know, heat is not what you're watering to cope with. When you're watering plants, you're watering to cope with thirst because they'll sit out in the heat all day long, full sun, and love it. So it's not like they're going, oh, it's so hot, I feel faint. <laughs> they love it. That's what they're... I guess I treat my plants like they're my children. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Time out. Yeah. Uh, they're adapted to it. You know, they're not people. They're not dogs, you know. Uh, when it gets too hot, my dog, he's at the back door like, I'm out. I'm Enough of this backyard, I want in. And he might drink when he comes in, but mainly he wants to lay on a cool floor. But uh, plants are adapted, especially almost all the ones we're dealing with here, to a lot of heat and a lot of sun. So you're watering uh, to take care of thirst. So, because if you water according that you're coping for heat, that's when people water too often. Because when your plants are first coming up, should you water a little more though to give them strength? Right. Well, the the, the key is is that you know, like I said, any anything that's established and has got a big root ball is more resilient. When you first planted something. Like, uh, some of them are really needy. These are the quintessential example of uh, newly planted needy plants. Because zinnias can be, once they're established, Tough as nails, uh, extremely heat tolerant. Uh, they're not going to fade from heat. They'll fade from thirst. And these guys, How big do those get? these guys, they get up like this. They're kind of a, a spreader, uh, profusion, extremely heat tolerant. They'll go all through the summer, uh, pretty much all through the fall. But, you know, they're puny little guys. Uh, and these roots are just aching to get out of here once you release it from captivity it gets underway but uh, plants are different because we have uh, periwinkles which are probably one of the most heat tolerant uh, plants that we have bloom their heads off from now until Thanksgiving uh, original plants uh, hail from Madagascar it's a hot place uh, they can go bone dry and not wilt. Now, if they stay that way, of course, they will eventually wilt. But you can pick up a periwinkle that is in the hot, you know, 100 degrees, absolutely bone dry, and it will not have wilted. Now, it will. Whereas 
this guy in the same condition, he is going to be completely folded up, completely wilted, and he, depending on how long he stays there, he might not come back. So, you know, these are needy guys, but once they're established, they can, they can take as much heat as a periwinkle. But that's just an example of what? Uh, zinnias can see themselves. I wouldn't count on, you know, them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, zinnias are one of the zinnias are one of the quickest and most productive thing from seed of the of the annuals. Easy. But uh, so that's the deal. You know, the more established, the tougher. So you're right. Once you've initially planted something in a pot or a raised bed or whatever, you my kind of the rule of thumb is you really better be looking at it at least at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day or when you get home from work. Because if it's new and we have one of these windy days, uh, they don't really benefit from being tortured. Uh, if they want to drink, give it to them. And uh, let's see. Let me. Okay. And the other thing, when you when you initially plant. Uh, perennials or annuals, whatever you're doing for uh, butterflies, it'd be a good idea to use some sort of a uh, granular or a uh, uh, slow release fertilizer. You can do synthetic or organic, and then uh, that will last six weeks, maybe eight weeks, but you would also supplement that with a liquid fertilizer, either synthetic uh, or we have organic types that you would do every week or 10 days. And that gives them a little shot in the arm and keeps them going. Because the uh, if it's in a container or a raised bed, typically you're going to be watering more often. And uh, nitrogen, one of the most important nutrients, is very water soluble. So it will either be, you put it in solution the plant will take it up, or if you, as you're watering, it will be leached away. So you'll have to replenish it, you know, not a whole bunch, but a little at a time to keep things really growing. And that's, that's another thing that as the uh, plants go into the summer, that's kind of what sustains them. If they're not getting, uh, it doesn't have to be a big meal, but a frequent little meal, if they're not getting uh, enough nutrition, they're not going to be able to perform and stand up to the heat. And also, they're not going to bloom as much. So, you know, that's one of the other things that you've got to keep up with. And now I'll uh, run through some of the things here. First of all, I'll get some guys out of the way that you may think, well, does that really attract a butterfly or a hummingbird? Well, no, nope, that doesn't. But it's a really neat dark green background. That's a needlepoint holly used in the 6 to 12 foot range. Evergreen, very tough. Uh, anything that is set in front of something that's dark green helps to make it pop. And that would also, as it gets bigger, that kind of functions as a windbreak and also a cover for butterflies. And that's a maiden grass, ornamental, very tough perennial. Uh, you know, middle to late summer will have the seed heads, uh, very attractive and a nice background. Uh, the butterflies may not pay attention to it, but I really like it. So it's going in there. Uh, and of course, in the fall, when we get cold weather, you know, it's going to change colors, but you won't cut it back until like mid-February. 
because that's about the time it starts new growth for the following year. But up to that point, it still fills, you know, the landscape with a form, just the color changes. And that varies according, I think this guy is like a three to five. It's a, a shorter variety. Some of them are five to six. We'll also get later uh, a uh, dwarf uh, fountain grass, which is called a uh, hamlin. And it's like a three by three, kind of a dome, uh, really neat uh, seed heads and an extremely uh, tough perennial that'll come back. And it's a good neighbor. It's not gonna take over, get oversized. part of our fitness program and this guy you know this guy's starting to starting to bloom and this guy let me see what what variety he is there are several uh, and this is a royal purple uh, smoke bush and it'll get 10 to 15 feet and it's got really gorgeous foliage it'll lose its leaves in the winter and the reason for smoke is when these blooms come out that's about what they look like a bunch of little blooms and when they get covering the it just looks like it's got smoke all over it but a neat color No. No, not a mountain or I'm sorry. Um, no, no. No. It's, it's a different. It's just, it smoke is, I mean, the okay. blooms are tiny. They're just a whole bunch of them. And it just looks like smoke. But it loses its leaves. Very tough. Gets to be a pretty good size. But they're just add to, you know, some of the, the uh, atmosphere. That's the word I was looking for. And let's see, that'll do it. Now we'll get into the things that attract butterflies, hummingbirds. The short list for if you want to attract butterflies, I've got a big long list. The short list is verbena, pentas, lantana, Butterfly bush and zinnias. Those are the. Well, in fact, when I was when I was pulling this cart, there was one working on the the uh, sage here while I was pushing the cart. So uh, there's a big long list, uh, and of course, all of these guys here, except the ones I mentioned. There, well, here's another one. Now, but I love it because, you know, dark greens and neat backgrounds, but uh, silver, you know, makes other things pop too. Uh, blues, yellows, uh, and of course this is uh, Artemisia Palace Castle, and it's the one that's most adapted here. Very tough, gets two feet, maybe a little more, three feet wide. Um, most winters will be evergreen, but a very dependable uh, perennial. No, or, or it, would be in, it would be invisible. But uh, uh, one of the good things about it, deer hate it. It's got a, it's got a d distinctive smell, and I'm sure an even more distinctive taste, and they don't like it. So, pardon? Do you have a butterfly just out here? Yes, I do. I have several. Here they are. In fact, there are a bunch of varieties these days, and a lot of them are uh, compact. And this one, uh, Summer Sips Sangria. And that one is a three to four by three to four. Neat color. 
and force it in. We've got uh, Pugsters, uh, and we've got those in different colors, and they're typically a, you know, two by two. That's a white. And uh, got a blue and kind of a, a light purple. Yeah. Pardon? And those, the Pugsters, are two by two. Um, this guy here is like maybe four by four. And I'm thinking. Of course, a lot of the, the older varieties got big. You know, some of them would get seven, eight feet or more. And let's see. And this one is uh, Flutter by Petite Blue. I thought it might be a bigger one, but Petite doesn't sound real promising in that regard. I would guess this one's probably going to be four by four, maybe a little more. And of course, if it says butterfly bush, I mean, that kind of self-explanatory. And of course, here's a uh, another one of the sages, uh, Santa Barbara uh, Salvia Mexican bush sage. And if I was going to have one of these, it's not one of my most favorite, but if I was going to have one, uh, Santa Barbara is the one to have. I've seen them at the years ago at the Fort Worth Botanical Garden. They're a little more com compact than the regular ones. Uh, great, great appearance. And they typically bloom midsummer into the fall, but uh, very attractive. And let's see. Of course, on the front here, we've got uh, Autumn Sage. And that was, these are some others that the uh, hummingbird moth was going over while I was picking them. Uh, the neat thing about these, uh, evergreen to semi-evergreen, uh, typically two to three feet tall and wide. Neat colors, uh, kind of a hot pink and some razzle-dazzle reds, purple, and... Those will bloom from mid-spring until probably Thanksgiving. And, of course, over time, what you can do on these, you don't have to. They'll keep blooming anyway. But as the uh, blooms are finished, you can uh, uh, deadhead them, you know. And, of course, when you do that, when you take out the one that's blooming, uh, typically on either side of it, there's already buds there. So if you don't do that, they'll still keep doing it. Uh, but if you have a, a, a pot or a planter that's in kind of a high visibility place, you might want to have it a little more manicured. And, and uh, very, very tough. And that's kind of like uh, it has a, a scent to it. And it's kind of like lantana. You like it or you hate it. Um, I like it. Of course, I like the way lantana smells. Uh, and since I mentioned that one, we have a uh, new gold, which is, uh, you know, that one's going to be a couple feet, maybe more tall, three feet wide, trailing purple. Well, I may have missed getting a Dallas red, but that's a real, it's a bigger one. It'll get two feet, two and a half, maybe three feet tall and wider. Uh, a really neat red orange color. Uh, very tough plant. Of course, I keep sneaking these things in that I don't know if, I don't know if they attract butterflies or not, but I like it, so it made the cut. And it, and it makes everything else look so good. 
you know, this is the uh, Texas Primrose and almost evergreen and loves the sun and heat and kind of sprawls on the ground. This is specifically one of those that uh, don't, don't water it too frequently. You know, as little water as possible is what makes those guys happy, but they're just gorgeous. And... I mentioned verbena. These are annuals. They love them. And you have a bunch of gorgeous colors. They tend to sprawl sideways. And that's another one that water when they need it, but don't keep them soggy. You know, white, red. You've got everything covered. And then this is the perennial uh, homestead purple. And this is one of the real tough guys. It's uh, actually evergreen. Only gets about this tall, but the blooms will come up above the, the foliage. It'll bloom, you know, mid-spring until Thanksgiving, maybe later, depending on the weather. But extremely tough, very heat tolerant. Once it's established, uh, uh, drought tolerant. We'll touch on some hummingbird items. Of course, this year we got in a bunch of peonies, which were kind of at the southern extreme of where they want to be. But hummingbirds like them. We got a bunch of buds on them. Uh, further north, that's one of the most popular. And daylilies, hummingbirds go for those. And of course, daylily, meaning that. The bloom lasts a day, and you think, well, how could that be very productive? Well, that's one bloom, and it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven others right there beside it. So that one will last today, but tomorrow that guy will be open. And it's got another stem here, and as they get bigger, and of course, this guy's got four of them coming on. So, and uh, very long life on these, very tough. And then this is probably one of the uh, hummingbird star attractions. And this is, uh, most people get the pronunciation wrong. It's uh, Agastaki or Agastaki. And this was Sunrise Rose, and it will bloom, you know, from mid-spring through the summer into the fall. And, of course, you can see very tubular flower, which hummingbirds are just made for. It varies by, by variety. Let me grab my eyeballs. That's the neat thing about most of the plants nowadays. They have a really good descriptive tag. That one will get two feet, so it'll go another six inches, maybe 12. You know, when things get happy, perennials, they can, tend to get a little bigger. And when they get happy and they get more established, they end up exceeding their, their billing a lot of times. But uh, very long bloom season and uh, neat colors. How would that? Isn't that kind of cool? They're bouncing off each other. And firecracker plant. And this one is vermilionaire. And it'll get 28 inches. Loves the heat. And let's see. And, of course, this is uh, butterfly weed, which uh, hummingbirds also like butterfly weed. Typically, they bloom red, orange. 
and let's see. Let's see if we got anybody. Anybody else? Well, here's one for hummingbirds. The uh, common name coral bells or hookera. They put up the blooms on little stems. Hummingbirds like these. This guy's just starting. They're uh, evergreen and compact and will take quite a bit of shade. And one of the things, they're a little demanding. They want to have pretty good drainage. So they're kind of easier in a raised bed or a pot. If you're putting them in a flower bed, be sure to amend the soil to where it's got a, a good texture. And see. Of course, old standby lavender. Uh, butterflies go for it. And okay. Now we'll head for. I. I don't have any hibiscus. That's another one that uh, hummingbirds go for. And I meant to bring uh, a uh, trumpet vine. We've got some really neat trumpet vines over there in a three gallon, more of a, a reddish bloom, more so than the typical kind of orange. And hummingbirds love those. And we also have, I didn't get to it. I'd have collect the whole place if I had enough time. Uh, it takes me a long time to put all this stuff back up. Uh, we've got some really neat um, coral honeysuckle, and that's another uh, hummingbird uh, attracting one. And of course, those uh, you want it. They like sun, and uh, the uh, those particular ones. Uh, it's best if they get start getting the sun early in the morning. So if we have dew or rain from the night before that it dries up as quickly as possible for the foliage so you don't get you know uh, uh, fungal problems on them and now we're on a roll for the butterflies sedums I think in Asia these are called the live forever plant although it disappears in the winter now the little ground cover sedum you know they're evergreen but these guys that get taller and bloom in the fall, the big blooms, uh, come January, they'll disappear, you know, freeze to the ground, but uh, extremely tough, uh, drought tolerant. And, uh, and of course, they're one that look particularly good uh, in the fall, you know, around the grass, like the maiden grass or uh, things like that. You know, the, perennial. they're perennial, you know. They will uh, be there forever, full sun to part sun. It cannot get too hot for them. And then, and they will have a big don't, bunch of little flowers, you know, in a cluster, kind of like, uh, you won't confuse them with yarrow, but it's kind of a similar deal. They've got a bunch of little flowers in a cluster, and they'll make a huge uh, cluster of blooms, and it's kind of like a, I kind of call these guys the uh, butterfly landing pad. Here we go. There you go. Uh, but uh, very showy. This one is... And this one with the gray foliage. I'm a sucker for gray foliage. This is a moonshine yarrow. And you can see here... These are buds coming on, and a few years back, I didn't count them. I don't remember what year, but this guy made the uh, perennial of the year. So that's a really neat looking one. Uh, and of course, it's going to be a, a yellowish, pretty close to that. So you can have a really, really neat mix of things. Okay. Uh, pin cushion or scabiosa uh, this one and these are all all buds coming out and uh, the uh, our big population of uh, hummingbird moss this year this is a regular stop and these guys kind of their off season will be 
uh, like July, August in the heat, that's kind of their their slow time. But uh, the neat thing about these guys, they're actually uh, evergreen. So if you happen to take a look out in the butterfly garden or the perennial garden in January or February, foliage on this is going to look spotless. It's just a gorgeous plant in the winter. Of course, standby tough perennials, the Coreopsis, bunch of different leaf types. That's another one that uh, blooms all through the summer, extremely uh, heat tolerant. And I did mention Penta on that list. We're just at the beginning. You know, red, white, these guys are a uh, uh, butterfly magnet. And surprisingly, uh, last you know, July or August, we had, I don't remember the name of the variety, but it was a white one, and we just got it in. We got in about 20 of them in hanging baskets that were just, you know, gorgeous. And... Uh, one afternoon I looked up and they were kind of hanging on each side down the row and a hummingbird was working them over and he worked all the way down and then he went on the other side of the aisle and worked all the way back up. So uh, what does that tell us, you know? What is the thing that you always hear about hummingbirds? They like red. Well, evidently they like white too. So, so uh, uh, I was I was surprised. I, I if he'd been doing it on a red penta, I would have thought, yeah, yeah. But it was solid white, and he just or she loved it. Of course, uh, alyssum is another little one. You know, likes full sun. Uh, very uh, pretty uh, cold weather tolerant. And it's another one that, uh, you know, it's least favorite time, July, August. At that point, they'd want to have an eastern exposure. Blazing hot afternoon sun in the middle of the summer. Not their thing, but a tough little plant, fragrant, and uh, butterflies love it. Another uh, tough perennials, black-eyed Susan, and... This one, let's see. Boy, what a name. I should have said the third at the end of this. Rising Sun Chestnut Gold. Well, gorgeous. Butterflies love them. A tough perennial. Here's kind of the original... Uh, one that everybody else has measured against, the uh, Black Eyed Susan Rudbeckia uh, Goldsturm. And he's just getting started. But, you know, there's it. Now that has a wildflower look. That's going to, that has a real butterfly garden look to it. Very tough plant. Blooms for a long time. Columbine, most of the columbines are kind of uh, temporary, not that adapted here, but this is the Texas Gold, and hummingbirds like it, and that one is uh, probably an eastern exposure, you know, in fact, one of the kind of quintessential planting modes for this is, you know, plant it under a redbud tree, that way it gets the early gets the winter and early spring full sun and then by the time that the uh, the red buds coming out it'd be ready for a little more shelter which it'll give it but it'll still have enough light to work and of course just a uh, plumbago could be a very tender perennial but I you know you probably have to protect it but that's one of those blues and neat color. And, let's see. and then, no, 
we've got uh, a couple varieties here of Gara. This is a uh, sparkle white, and and these guys they'll get up about like that, get to be a pretty good sized clump. And then here's one with the reddish foliage, graceful pink, and and this one's more compact, 12 to 18 inches, but a really Yeah, well, you know, they come in a range of sizes, but these guys will get underway. And then and here's another one that, uh, as far as uh, butterflies, uh, Greg's Mist Flower. And these typically uh, are mid to late summer really when they bloom and into the fall but when they do it they're a uh, butterfly magnet and a different different look not my favorite but butterflies you know okay and let's see and That's a type of uh, locust. locust. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, food. Uh, around here, one of the most dependable, if you want to have a uh, uh, butterfly show up and lay eggs and have caterpillars on your property, and raise some uh, butterflies in your garden. Uh, three things, three things to plant: dill, fennel, and parsley. Par parsley. And oh, uh, dill. Wait a minute, dill. I made. I as a combination. It doesn't exist, but if it does, you'll see it here first. Um, dill, fennel, and parsley. Parsley being probably the third choice, but uh, dill and fennel, uh, they show up on. In fact, when we have it out here and wherever I've been for the past 30 years, if you've got dill and fennel, uh, we're a little early yet, but when the swallowtails uh, show up, uh, you are going to have them uh, without fail. In fact, here in the recent few years, we have people show up and uh, sometimes they ask me, you know, do the dill have uh, caterpillars yet? And they come back here and they might buy um, six or eight or ten of them and they get half of them without and they get half of them with caterpillars. You know, very few people you know, um, well, I guess a few don't want the caterpillars, but most people go for it uh, because those grow fast enough that, uh, you know, and it's kind of neat to watch the caterpillars. They're, you know, almost as big as my little finger, and they've got the stripes, green, white, yellow, and some black in there. And if you, uh, if you irritate them, they have orange antennae. And it's like a uh, horror movie. You poke them and the, the, the antennae inflate and come out like, you know, but uh, really pretty. But I guess it's been a few years ago. We had them back here and I saw a swallowtail over there and she was kind of, you know, messing around for a little bit. And I thought it looks like she's laying eggs. And it took her about five minutes, and then she flew off, and I went over and just turned the leaf over, and there were the eggs. And in just a few days, we had a crop of big caterpillars. And um, my, my grandson years ago, he had a big fennel plant, which there's green and uh, these are the bronze, and the bronze are perennial, and they get big. And... I've got pictures. Pardon? Can you put them in a pot? Oh, sure. Yeah. And uh, they, 
I've got a picture somewhere on some phone, uh, maybe, that uh, I, he must have, the thing was this big around and this tall, and he had 50 or 60 caterpillars on there. And uh, it was so big and, and vigorous that uh, it didn't really look the worst for wear. And I think he, he went through about three generations. You know, they put the, uh, the caterpillars finished up. And then he, he saw them uh, come out and unfurl their wings. So uh, neat thing, neat thing for kids. And of course, the, if you if you don't have uh, dill or fennel, sometimes we we're out and you look over and they're on the parsley. So Italian or curled, uh, but they'll go for that too. But that's you know kind of a, a, a fun thing. And uh, the thing, the other thing that you can do is, you know, in your butterfly garden and whatever is don't disperse it throughout your yard. You know, it's best if you concentrate it because uh, it's like, uh, like us, they, they prefer a buffet. One spot that you can have a bunch of different things. Uh, so keep things, they don't have to be crammed, but don't disperse them throughout your yard. I mean, you can some, but if you really want to have them show up and appreciate it, uh, have a pretty good crowd of things relatively close together. And of course, you can, you can uh, numerous ways you can do that. Uh, uh, window boxes, or the same kind of thing as a window box that would go on a deck railing and then hanging baskets and big pots. It's kind of easy to figure out how you could have a cluster of those kinds of things. And of course, when you're thinking about uh, hanging baskets too, um, I think one thing that people tend to do, and it's like, let's explore this a little more, and that is uh, hanging baskets don't have to be up there you know you can have hanging baskets that are they're just not on the ground I mean if you have a big tree you can hang them to where they're a couple feet off the ground and uh, kind of protects it from the dog um, uh, but you can have a bunch of different layers and that's going to increase the attractiveness uh, to butterflies and at this point while I think any questions Yes. What do you do about deer? Well, the <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they uh, it's of course that's one of the things you know they don't like those and they don't like cat mint, so you can you can plant those guys around because it has a deterrent effect. If there's something they like and you put stuff that they find disgusting that helps. I think the most effective thing that I've ever heard of, and I've had customers here say that they have it, and it really, really works. Of course, it's not 10 bucks, but they have a uh, item that's a motion sensor, and it's connected to an impact sprinkler. And when it detects deer showing up, Everybody know, you know, a, a, an impact sprinkler. That's one of those that goes. <laughs> well, deer, they can't, they can't unlearn their startle response. You know, they're a prey animal, and you know, coyotes and wolves and and uh, uh, you know, wildcats and pumas. You know, they're a they're a food item. So their survival techniques, it's kind of like when, when we step on a nail, you don't think, well, I ought to pull my foot off that nail. It, it doesn't get to your brain. It goes to your spinal cord, and your, your foot jumps back automatically. Well, the deer have the same thing, a startle response. If they hear something that's kind of scary, they don't wait around to figure out what it is because that means they're a meal. They just immediately bolt and go away. So when they show up and that happens, 
they kind of learn that that's not the place to go. But they, they don't ever get to the deal of, oh, that's just the sprinkler. You know, it still scares them no matter what. But that's the most effective. Well, we have some uh, citronella up there. And it's a, a, a kind of a, a pungent smell. A bunch of them up there are in bloom now. Um, we've got some pretty good sized ones. And I also have inside uh, Copper Canyon daisies in a gallon pot. And I don't know about, I like the smell of citronella, but Copper Canyon daisies, I, don't, I can't testify about mosquitoes, but it repels me. Uh, it, it, you just brush the foliage with your hand and I could see how they, they wouldn't uh, be attracted to it. Yes. Right. Uh, that would be the uh, trumpet vine that we have, and it's very vigorous. Of course, it loses its leaves in the winter, and then, uh, but the 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 coral honeysuckle. You can look at the ones we have and see that's you know uh, same type as what you have. But yeah, that may be it. Right. Right. Yeah. And probably the trumpet vine would be the the most attractive, and it grows fast. And the one we have has got a really attractive color. It's one of those uh, that you look at the uh, the tag on it, and you see the flower, and uh, I start thinking, wonder where I could put one of those because it's a neat looking neat looking flower. Any other questions? Well, uh, I'll review to make sure I haven't left anything out. Just a note, if you, when you're planting, uh, one of the things I do, if you know, and it go for if you're doing a container or a raised bed or really anything, before you start digging the hole or whatever, what's the first thing you do? Water all the plants. Because you don't want to plant a plant that's needing a drink. So water all the plants and then you start working on the digging the hole or whatever. And then of course when you uh, take the item out, you know, use your fingers to kind of loosen the roots around the sides and the bottom. And then of course when you plant it, uh, slow release fertilizer and then typically when I water it, I probably after that I'll go ahead and use a water soluble fertilizer then get it planted, and then I'll hit it again with a, uh, a solution of a uh, liquid fertilizer to where they get off to a start. Okay, I guess that'll do it for this time. <laughs>